Hi, Christina Johnson here. Welcome to the segment on what is good therapy and treatment planning. I was pondering on that question. What is good therapy? Well, I asked myself, one, does it work? And the one thing that really makes therapy work, as we all know, is the relationship, that therapeutic relationship. So I thought I'd share with you guys today about what are some of the things that I do when a new family or client is coming in through the doors on how do I establish safety and start building rapport and building that relationship. And so my intro always starts with confidentiality. I think that confidentiality is super important. And usually when I'm meeting with clients, they've already gone over confidentiality in their intakes. I work at Western Youth Services in Anaheim. And so typically the clients are assigned to me after they've already had an intake session. At their intake session, they have filled out questionnaires and they have talked at length with their parent and the therapist about the problems that bring them in for therapy. And so they're probably expecting when they come in to see me more of that, that they're expecting that they're going to talk about what caused the problem, what are the problems that bring them in for therapy, how they are the problems. <laughs> the parents are oftentimes worried or assuming that they're going to be blamed for why the problems are happening. And so I kind of, um, I like to start with confidentiality so that way they know that what we talk about in there stays in there. And I share with them that I know I wouldn't tell my therapist half of what I tell him if I didn't know that it was going to stay in there in that room. And so I self-disclose that I also have a therapist and that I applaud them for coming in. To, um, to work on themselves, to work on their relationship, and to better their lives. Not everybody does that. Everybody has mental health and everybody has struggles, but not everybody has the courage to come into therapy. So I really start off with just giving them props for that. Um, after going over the limitations of confidentiality, I talk to them a little bit about informed consent. You know, it's important to know what to expect. And that's what treatment plans are really all about too, is so that way they can know what to expect in therapy. What's it gonna look like? What are we going to be doing in here? And so I let them know that I always have an assessment period. I work at a Medi-Cal clinic, and so there is an official assessment period but even in private practice that I started doing in the last year, I talk about this assessment period that I have with my clients when we're first getting to know each other. And I talk to them about that this is our time where I'm going to be getting to know you and you're going to be getting to know me. And we're going to be coming up with our treatment plan, our care plan. And the care plan is basically like a map. It's going to be a road map. And it's going to have on it our destinations and what your goals are coming in for therapy. So in the beginning, as you get to know more about me, I'm going to be getting to know more about you. And today is going to be all about what matters to you and what destinations do you want to see on this map. So I think that... One of the things for good therapy that's important is to have a balanced relationship. I, I let them know that I'm a marriage and family therapist. I am very relationship focused. And so it's important to me that there's a balance in the room, that I find out what matters to both of them. Working at a Medi-Cal clinic, everything is very clear client focused. You even have to document everything as client, client, client. It's very much the identified patient or the IP that just drives me crazy. But ah, 
We got to do what we got to do so that way they can get their services and Medi-Cal will pay for it, right? So I let them know that I am a relationship therapist, that I am focused on the relationship and that both of them matter very much to me. A lot of times working with teenagers, they'll come in and the parent will want to stay in the lobby or drop them off even and drive away to go to Walmart and do some shopping while I meet with them. And so I let them know that they matter and that I want to know what matters to both of them. So good therapy, that good relationship. I work on that from the get-go with reflective listening. Feels really, really good whenever I have someone truly show that they are trying to understand how I'm feeling, my perspectives on things, and how I see not just the problems that bring us in for therapy, but what I want. What's my end game? What's my buy-in? That's what I'm exploring. That's what I want to hear from um, each of the family members about. What's their buy-in? So I kind of have trucker eyes <laughs> when I'm meeting with a family. I, I'm, I'm listening to both of them. When, when one's talking, I'm also looking over at the other one. So we kind of laugh about that, that I'm like, I know I've got kind of trucker eyes. <laughs> so it's like I'm doing EMDR or something on myself. Maybe it helps me stay calm. Hmm. I haven't thought about that before. But um, it is important to me to be mindful about the balance. I, um, I want to make sure that I'm hearing from both of them, which can be kind of difficult whenever one of the family members in the room um, tends to do most of the talking. So I am very strength-based. In my intro, when I first get to know people and I let them know, hey, every therapist does things different. Sometimes the clients come in and they've had therapy before. And so I want to explore that. I want to see what was their experience like before? What did they like about it? What did they not like about it? How can I not recreate the wheel here and build off of what they liked from their previous experience or, you know, not repeat the same mistakes? So um, I'm a very straightforward, very transparent type of therapist, and my clients tend to like that. I've gotten a lot of feedback from the families that they like that I'm a straight shooter. I call it how I see it, and um, I'm very honest with my clients and very straightforward, and they tend to respond really well to that. So they tend to know what my theory of change is. I know that we're in MFT theories and techniques and that many of you are going to be discovering um, what is your theory of change, which one do you gravitate towards most? And so I like to let my clients know that from the get-go that every therapist does things different. Some therapists like to um, talk a lot about the past and generations in the past and doing genograms and believe that, you know, that insight and that understanding to patterns is how change happened. And, um, you know, I tell them that I kind of roll with the present and the future. I do believe that it is important for us to talk about the past and to talk about the problems. And it's a huge way of connecting and building that rapport is being able to, you know, bear witness to their stories and to have them be heard in that sacred space in my office. Um, but I let them know that I am a solution-focused therapist at heart and that a lot of the time in my office we're going to be spent on, you know, how do they want their lives to be? How do they want their relationships to be together? How do they want things to be between them? And... How are we going to get there? And so today, tomorrow, and the next day, which is really quite relieving for a lot of the teens and families that come in through the door who have heard and heard and heard again about what's wrong and what's the problem. And they're done dredging up the past. They're kind of ready 
to move forward. So what's their buy-in? You know, there's that whole willingness factor. When I think about what is good therapy and does therapy work, I think about how willing are they? You know, how willing are they? Sometimes I see clients that are come in on a court mandate that they're there because they're probation officers making them come. Specializing in teenagers, a lot of times they are drug in there and they don't want to be there. So it doesn't stay that way. And so I think that that's really a testament to how well I'm able to find out what is their buy-in. What is their buy-in? What matters to each of them? And so I have an intervention that I'd like to share with you guys. One of the ways that I find out what's their buy-in and what matters to them. And it helps out a lot with the treatment planning. So I have a lot of sticky notes. I should probably take up stock in sticky notes. I think I should do that. But I have two different colored sticky notes and I give one to the parent or to the parents, whoever's in the room, the caregiver. And I give the other to the client or the teenager. And you can do this with couples. You can do this with larger families. Um, most frequently I'm meeting with a single caregiver and with their child. So, but you can, you can really mix it up and do this with anybody. So I have in my office the door that people come in through. And I have a wall on the other side that's actually a window. The whole wall is a window. And so I give them sticky notes and I give them each a pen. And then I say, okay, you guys know that I want to find out what matters to you. And I want to find out what matters to both of you. And it might be different and some of it might be the same. So I also am curious as to how you see the problems that brought you in and how you see um, where this is going, where you want this to therapy to go. So I instruct them to, on their own little sticky notes, to write out how they see the problems that brought them in for therapy and then to place them on the window wall. And so sometimes they're kind of like, huh, can you give me an example? And yeah, I let them know if you're feeling stuck, then think of thinking, feeling, doing questions. So what were some of the problems with feeling? Like how did you guys feel when the problems were at their worst? Or what did you notice that you saw that Jane or Johnny was feeling depressed or we noticed this, that they were self-harming or, you know, that there's trouble at school or whatever it is, um, they write that down. Um, what goes on between you guys? I ask that a lot. Um, what's going on between you guys when the problems are at their worst? And so they place the sticky notes. Sometimes they place each sticky note up as they do it. Other clients, they like to write a sticky note down, put it on their thigh, put, write a sticky note down, put it on their thigh. They make a pile and then they place them all up there at once. And I tell them there's no right or wrong way to do it. There's no quota on how many sticky notes. This is just for me to find out what matters to you guys. So then after they're done going and placing the sticky notes up on the window wall. Then before reading through them, I point over to the door that they just came in through. And I point out that that is also the door that one day they are going to walk out of when they graduate and successfully terminate from therapy with me. So I want to know how are they going to know when they're ready to graduate from therapy. So same thing, thinking, feeling, doing. Maybe it's the opposite of some of those sticky notes on the window. Get really thinking about how are you guys going to know when things are better, when better enough that we feel ready to successfully end therapy. 
And I usually say, when you're ready to be like, bye, Christina, we don't need you anymore. And they tend to laugh at that. So I sit quietly and pretend not to peek over at the window wall and try to see what they're writing. And usually family members, they kind of look at each other. Oh, what's the mother writing up there? Hmm. And so I say, no peeking. I have to kind of laugh. So then they put them up on the door. And then we process. We process, process, process. So I ask them to share with me what they wrote. And anybody can go first. So they share with me what they've placed over on the window. And I think that... Good therapy is when I'm focused on the process, not so much on the content. So what goes on between them and what is that like for them? If, um, let's say that the parent puts on the board, you know, that they are harming themselves. What is that like for you? Okay, what does that bring up for you as a parent? So... I really um, try to stay out of the weeds and try not to get too lost in content by staying in the process of what goes on for them, what goes on for them individually and what goes on for them relationally and how is this a relational issue. It's not about the IP here. It's not all on the parent and it's not all on the kiddo. It's all between them. So I really do start from our very first session on making it relational. So um, the sticky note intervention is something that really helps with treatment planning. I noted that from before explaining it. So how does it help with treatment planning? In the treatment plan or care plan, as it's called for Medi-Cal, there are treatment goals and the services and the frequency of services. And for some counties, not for Orange County, but for LA County and Shasta County, Riverside County, um, you have to actually say how many minutes. <laughs> you don't have to stick to it exactly, but Medi-Cal wants to know about how many minutes are you gonna be billing for. So I'm grateful to be in Orange County where it's a little less specific. But anywho, getting back to the sticky notes and how does this help me to write my treatment plan? How does it help me conceptualize? Well, there's SMART goals. SMART goals are an important part of the care plan because like I said before, the care plan is a map. It has our destinations of where we want to go in therapy. How are they gonna know when they're like, bye, Christina? We don't need you anymore. So these sticky notes with their own words on it, I use those quotes. So that way, this care plan, this treatment plan is not Christina's goals for this family. They're not the principal's goals, the probation officer's goals, not anybody else's. These are their goals. This is their buy-in. This is what matters to them. This is their motivation. This is that willingness. That's the key to making good therapy, making therapy work, right? I want to make sure that I am staying focused with my eyes on the prize onto what matters to them. So I mentioned SMART goals, S-M-A-R-T. Um, what makes a good goal is that it's specific, hence the quotes, right? It's specific, it's measurable. So we try to make it measurable and it's achievable. So it can't be some lofty thing, like their goal is that they're going to win the lottery um, and um, no longer have to go to school or at work or, you know, whoever passed away in their family is going to be risen from the dead. Like it needs to be achievable and it needs to be realistic. And then the T is timed. Timed. 
Going back a little bit to the informed consent, it's important to know what to expect. And at the different clinics that you're going to be working at and at the different clinics that I've worked at, which has actually only been two because I've been at Western Youth Services for over 10 years now. <laughs> Um, but before that, I worked as an MFT trainee at the Garden Grove Police Department at the FYOP, Family and Youth Outreach Program, through the Boys and Girls Club. It's a mouthful. But there, it was 12 weeks. You meet with the families. You meet with the juveniles, the Boys and Girls Club. Hence, I've always worked with the younger kiddos. But it was 12 weeks. So you let them know that from the beginning. It's good for them to know what to expect, right? It's a little different at Western Youth Services. I was really surprised when I started working there. And I was like, what? You have a six-month review? You have an annual review? You have clients that have been here for over a year or for multiple years? It was, it was radical to me. And now I've been there for so long that it's like, a little less radical, but as brief solution focused therapist, it's still not ideal for me to have a client for too long. Sorry about that. So the SMART goals as a part of the treatment plan is important because it also gives them those expectations to, okay, keep my eyes on the prize. This is what I want. And this is the deadline. Like, I, I want to achieve this by this date. I let my clients know that I don't like the word homework, um, but they're going to get out of therapy what they put into therapy. And if they're only putting into therapy 45 minutes once a week, then that's what they're going to get out of it. But if they're willing to practice the new skills and the and if they're willing to actually implement the solutions that they're coming up with, that they're proposing in our sessions, then they're going to get to their destination faster. I also let people know that usually if we meet together as the family, um, that I tend to see the changes happen faster and last longer than individual work. So it's not cookie cutter for everybody, but it's just kind of one of the things that I've noticed. So SMART goals, they're specific, they are measurable, they are achievable, realistic, and timed. The um, services on the care plan, there's the goals and there's the services. The services, it's important to collaborate with my clients on them as well. I always let the families know that they have the reins on their treatment, that I am a trusted Sherpa on the mountain, but ultimately they have the reins. They are in charge. And so part of informed consent for us is that I let them know based on the assessment period and their sticky notes, how they view the problems that bring them in, how they view their desired outcome of services, that here's some of the different options that we have for services. This is usually where I let them know the different modalities that I am trained in. And I am trained in quite a few different evidence-based practices. So uh, I educate them about FFT, which is functional family therapy. I educate them if they have a lot of trauma and that seems to be holding them back and part of their desired goals is that they want to be able to move past the past or they want to find healing from the past experiences, the shared traumas that they have, um, then I give them a lot of psychoeducation about TFCBT and EMDR. Um, TFCBT is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. I know, I know, it's a mouthful, right? <laughs> 
but I let them know about those different types of treatment and that they can choose and they can choose to change their mind. I have some clients that we start off um, planning on doing some EMDR and then they decide, no, I want to do a trauma narrative. Like I want to, I want to do more, more talking about and sharing about my story vice versa. Sometimes I'll start doing some TFCBT and they're just like, hey, I was thinking a little bit more about that eye thing <laughs> and maybe I want to try out some EMDR. So I always empower my clients to let them know that they are in control, that they are in charge of their treatment. And I just thank them for trusting me, for trusting me to to help them to reach their destination. Um, one thing about good therapy is that I remain humble. I am just a person and that I need their feedback. That this is a relationship and it is a two-way relationship. I, I really do need their feedback to make sure that I am still talking about and working on what matters to them. And if they really liked a session and they liked some stuff that we did in that, I need to know that so we can continue on that vein. If they did not like it, <laughs> I need to know that too so I can tailor the treatment to them. When I'm presenting a care plan and presenting a treatment plan, I let them know this is not written in stone. Okay, um, Medi-Cal is pretty specific and they want to know that, okay, we're going to do once a week family therapy. We're going to do um, twice a month individual therapy and they, they want to know that. So it is written out in the treatment plan. We're going to be doing this. I let them know that it's not written in stone. So if something's going on for you and you're needing more sessions. Let's say that there's some safety concerns going on and you need more than once a week, then we can do that. And we can meet maybe twice a week until you feel like you're out of the woods. Um, if we have a very individually focused month, let's say that we're working on a trauma narrative and we have all individual therapy that month with just a few case management check-ins with the family, that's okay too. I'm always going to be tailoring things and tweaking things to what they're wanting and what they're needing at that time. So I think that that's a part of what makes therapy good therapy is them knowing that they're in control. And that helps to build the safety and build the trust in our relationship. So the treatment plan I need to revisit it on a regular basis. Um, I don't typically wait for a six-month review um, to review their goals. Um, I get feedback at the end of each session. Some different evidence-based practices are more regimented on the type of feedback. Um, for example, FFT has some questionnaires, a baseline questionnaire, there's outcome measures, um, but sometimes just informally asking them at the end of every session. I always, now it's habit, that at the end of every session, how did you feel about our session? Did you, what did you like about the session? Was there anything you didn't like about the session? Is there anything that you'd really like me to focus on next week whenever we're meeting? So when we revisit the goals and the map, we take a look at the map and see where are we at. I love scaling questions. <laughs> I love scaling questions. Any of my clients know that about me. They, they, they're used to the scaling questions. It's a little weird at first if you haven't um, experienced a scaling question. Um, so I explain that... I really like scales. 
because numbers give us the common language to talk about really complex things like how are we doing so i think that having them define what does a 10 look like a 10 being when we're ready to bye christina we don't need you anymore and a one being like the window wall you know problems at their worst and having them each give their own rating of where they feel like that they're at, that that is another way of empowering them and helping me to stay on track. If I'm ever feeling stuck with a client, um, stuck with a family, it's usually because I don't have a good grasp on their goals and their end game and their buy-in. So we revisit it. Has it changed? Has it shifted? Is it totally different? Do you want to have a different buy-in? Maybe we've reached it. If we don't have a good treatment plan and we don't have a good structure, then therapy can easily plateau and we can find ourselves spinning our wheels or just talking about the weather or talking about the problem that happened that week and not really getting traction, not really getting anywhere which can be frustrating for them. And let's be honest, it can be frustrating for me too. So I want to feel like I'm helping them. And if we're just spinning our wheels, then I don't feel like I'm really being of maximum service to them. And so I want to make the most of, out of our time that we have in our office. And speaking of time, I'm pretty sure that my time is up on this video. So I hope that I shared something that might be helpful to you in um, coming up with treatment plans and working with families and doing good therapy. So I'll see you next time.